Take your Bibles open to Isaiah chapter number 55. Isaiah 55. Lynn and I went to the New York City. How many of y'all been to New York City? Yeah, man. I got a squeal from above in the back. Good Baptist there. That was a that was a baby amen. We went there and we uh flew in to the airport and we took a taxi. We stayed at a place called uh, Remington, about a half of a block from, it was on 46th Street, about a half a block from Times Square. And we just, we walked everywhere that we went for the whole week. We just walked or rode the subway. Yes, we rode the subway and lived to talk about it. It was good. We enjoyed it all. I enjoyed the food. I enjoyed everything. One of the very first things I wanted to see was I wanted to see the Empire State Building. So it was just a, just a little bit from, down from where we were staying, like four blocks or something like that. And uh, we walked down there to, to see the Empire State Building, and I got about four blocks too far, and I said, I missed it. How in the world do you miss a building that's 100 stories tall? Because on the ground level, it looked like everything else. So I turned around and looked up, and sure enough, it was right there. Three years ago, December of 2020, there was something that's so small that tackled me. COVID. I was minding my own business. And, and I just was breathing like normal. Y'all like breathing? Are y'all so good at it? You don't even have to work at it. It just happens. And somehow one of them dirty little COVID things got inside me and body slammed me when I wasn't looking. And I spent two weeks in the basement. Isolating from my wife. I think that's the furthest we've ever. She come down every now and again and say, "You still there? Where else am I gonna go? Take my brush and comb my hair." <clears throat> Yet God knows the weight of every large matter in life, and He sees the very smallest, most intricate details in full fashion. He sees the great; He never misses it. He sees the small. He never misses it. The fullness of God is beyond our capacity to understand. He is God. We define Him as that. All over the world, every language has a word for God. We're a monotheistic society. We say that there, are, there is one God. They call it different things. If you go to an AA meeting, they may say that your higher power is a doorknob. That's what you always talk about. Mine's a little bit bigger than that, but he, he created the stuff that made the doorknobs. We are really a polytheistic society because we have so many idols in our life. But when we talk about God, we call him the supreme, eternal being. No beginning. I don't care how back you look, he was there. He was always there. Now, just because you have a problem putting your hands around that doesn't change the fact that that's who our God is. <clears throat> he is, <clears throat> excuse my voice. I had a real good voice last Sunday, but I might struggle a little bit today. <clears throat> Whether you believe it or not, He has no end. I, I'll tell you, eternity, the Bible says in Genesis, eternity is in all of our hearts. But I don't understand it. I have, a, I have a problem trying to figure out something that didn't have a beginning and won't have an end. But that's God. It doesn't change the fact that that's who He is. He is sovereign. He is over all. He's the creator. But He's also the sustainer. Just because He made it, He didn't just take His hands off of it. I mean, I'm pretty good at breathing. I'm doing it all day, every day. I even do it at night when I'm sleeping. But I only have that oxygen because He provides it. It is there. And the heart of God is only good. You'll never find a time <clears throat> when God is not good. Didn't Rick, didn't you say that? God is good? And all the time? He can't help it. That's just who He is. And the ways 
and thoughts of God, God are far beyond ours. If you have your Bible in Isaiah 55, would you stand with us in reading of God's Word? <clears throat> We're going to begin in verse number 6. Seek the Lord while He may be found. That tells me one thing. There will be a time that you won't find Him even though you might seek Him. You better seek Him while He can be found. Call upon Him while He is near. Let the wicked forsake his ways, the unrighteous man, his thoughts. Any unrighteous people here who have unrighteous thoughts? Any of you just walk through your life and just you're doing the best that you can, all of a sudden something will come to your mind and you think, oh my goodness, right? Me too, me too. Let him return to the Lord and he will have mercy on him and to our God, he will abundantly pardon I love how that's phrased. It's not just that he pardons. Did you hear that? He abundantly pardons. Praise God. Amen? Amen. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. Last week I talked about we try to get God to join us when we're supposed to join him. He says, my thoughts are not what you're thinking. Uh -uh, uh -uh. I'm thinking beyond that. And your ways... That's not my ways. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven, and do not return there, but water the earth, and make it bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please. It shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the opportunity to once again be with your people, that we can open your word, that we can move our hearts towards you, our eyes to your word, our minds are now seeking you, our thoughts are needing you. Lord, we know that we come here to be challenged, and we pray that we will be open to change. Not simply for the sake of change, but because we need it. Because you're so much greater, so much more wonderful, you have so much more planned, and we need to move where we are into the glorious place of where you are. Father, I pray for a great year for our people. I pray for a great year for our church. I pray for a year of being more like Christ than I've ever been. I pray for a year that I will trust you more than I've ever trusted you before. That I will lean not into my own understanding, but I will see you, I will bless you, I will acknowledge you, I will praise you. Lord, let it begin. Refresh our vision. So that we can know you in spirit and truth. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. Beyond our capacity of, under, of understanding, yet he's benevolent enough to give us this thing called life. Let me talk to you about God and his ways. Let me talk to you about the angel project. Y'all remember the angel project? The God who was before all, he says, I think I'm going to create something. Let me create this thing called angels. There are angels, archangels, there are seraphim, there are cherubim, and there may be more that we just don't know about. But we know one thing, if they came into being, God created them. And he created them in his glory. When the angels were created, they did not debate the glory of God. They were there with the ability to see the glory of God. And the natural thing with angels, when you're in the presence of God, is you fall down in worship and praise and service. If Jesus Christ were to walk in that door and were walked down here, there is one thing that would happen. Every knee would bow, every tongue would confess that He is Lord of all. 
because he's God. And you would only get the opportunity to just to see him by the very grace of the hand of God. The angels were created with that. They were created perfect, complete, in the presence of God. And the natural thing that flowed from them was worship, praise, and service. Nobody had to say, you know what? It'd be a good thing for you to worship. No, it's the natural thoughts toward God. That's the angel project. In the presence of God's glory. Yet, they rejected his person as God, and they put themselves on the same level as God. They, one-third of them, put themselves on the same level in their own thoughts towards God. Now the human project. God created man with a capacity to know him. As a matter of fact, all of us want to know God. All of us. Everywhere around the world. I mean, there's some people who may call themselves agnostics or atheists, but they're still looking for something. They just are so prideful that they think that they know more. So they, they, they're going by their own understanding. I, I praise God that I see something that's beyond my understanding and hearing. Now, we have the opportunity to worship and serve as well. The choice is, will we? One cannot have a relationship with God unless they accept His deity. <clears throat> You cannot have a relationship with God <clears throat> unless you see Him and know He is God. You accept that. <clears throat> so the debate with all of us is in our thinking, who is God? The fallen angel said, I'm like God. <clears throat> that was sin. By the way, from that point forward, they were away from the presence of God. It's a downward spiral. The longer they go, the longer they exist, the more they are out of the presence and the glory of God, the worse their life is. Evil begets evil. <clears throat> Adam and Eve created perfect. In the presence of God, God came through and was with them in the cool of the evening. They had a relationship, but <clears throat> they fail. They fail. <clears throat> because they were told that they could be like God. And that sounded pretty good to them. You and I, we were born with a Fallen, sinful nature. All of you are sinners. I pray you're forgiven by the glorious blood of Jesus Christ. But we're all sinners. Y'all good with that? But you have to make the choice of calling Him Lord. Right? And if you do, and you accept His salvation, then you can have a relationship with God. No man comes to the Father but by Him. So we choose to call Him God. We choose Him as our sovereign. And we bow and worship Him. Kale, do you have Proverbs 1-7 up there? Put it up on the screen for us. Proverbs 1-7 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom. And understanding. I got uh, an app on my phone. It's called Blue Letter Bible. It's free. And it got, has all these versions of the Bible on it. And sometimes when I see a verse, I just want to see how all the other ones talk about it. I've never heard of this Bible before. It's called the BBE Bible in Basic English. Now, just listen to how they 
describe this verse. The fear of the Lord, it says, is the start of knowledge, but the fools have no use for wisdom and instruction. I like that last phrase there. The foolish, they have no use for wisdom and instruction. Why? Because they think they've already got it. Can I do my thing? I love breaking down verses of the Bible. This is, I think, why God called me, why he placed it upon my heart to preach. Because I just want to look at the Word of God and preach the Word of God. This verse says, the fear of the Lord. That does not mean, ah. That does not mean that there's this old man with this big white beard with thunderbolts and he's ready to strike you down if you do something wrong. A lot of people look at God like that. A lot of people had a domineering parent who was there. If you do wrong, I will. And they got a distorted view of God because they were taught a distorted view from man. But God is good. God is perfect. God is complete. The word fear here means to respect, to give reverence. It means to be revered. It means piety. Now, I love the old theologian John Calvin's definition of piety. He says it's this, reverence joined with the love of God which the knowledge of his benefits induces. Now Calvin says, because we understand of how good God is for us, we will give him reverence. Okay. Can I give you the Brian definition? This is my definition of piety. A true love of God and an understanding of his sovereignty and his natural benevolent nature, which leads to a life of worship, contemplation, and service to his glorious person. And yes, I said person. He defines himself. He puts himself on our level. Jesus Christ came to be like us so we could be like him. The fear of the Lord. The word Lord is Jehovah. It means the existing one. But it was too sacred for them to say. <clears throat> so when they got there, they would substitute the word Lord for Jehovah. Lord, Master. The fear of the one who is sovereign over all <clears throat> means that we understand that He is God, He is Master, we are not. The start of knowledge. Ignorance. Ignorance. I-G, ig, means cunning. Norance means to be aware or to have a knowledge of. Cunning, knowledge. You got Genesis 3-1 up there, Kale. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. Cunning. That's the word. Ignorance. To look at something, to be aware of it, and to think you have a knowledge of it, and you're so cunning... You can form it to you. Put them together. We got a lot of ignorant people out there doing what they think is right. Wisdom is taking that knowledge and taking the knowledge and living it. It's applied knowledge. How many of you have met so many people who have this library of facts in their mind. And they can quote those facts, but they have no practical application. Y'all know them? Don't mention their names. Does it make, do, when you're around those people, do you kind of shake your head? I know one, I say, I, uh, about that one that I know, I, I say, I'm not sure he knows 
how to take the paper off a straw. Now, he could tell you the thermodynamics of everything, but I'm not sure he knows how to take the paper off a straw. God help us be around those people. That's not wisdom. Being able to know facts has no practical purpose unless you're willing to live them. Applied knowledge is wisdom. How many of you know more of this than you're living? I'm going to give you another chance. How many of you have been to church so many times and you've heard so many sermons, you're almost sermon deaf. And you, 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 when you get to the end of it, you'll go, oh, that's good preaching. And then you walk out the door and it changes your life not one bit. How many of us leave the same way that we came? When confronted with the Word of God, we confronted with the presence and a relationship with God. When you meet Him in prayer, when you meet Him in the Word, when you meet Him in your circumstances, there's a great opportunity to trust Him, to move from where you are to where He is. That's called wisdom. But it comes with instruction. How many of you have learned from your failures? Is it not the greatest teacher? How many of you beat yourself up because of your failures? My goodness, I beat myself up. I mean, it's almost as if I think I'm perfect or I'm supposed to be perfect. But I know I'm not. And I know I'm going to mess up. I literally prayed right there where you are, Greg. I was sitting right there and I said, Lord, please don't let me mess up this morning. I literally prayed that because I, I think it's so important not to just know it, but not to walk through it. I want to, I want to preach with the Spirit of God. I want there to be an anointing. I want, to, I want the, the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart to be pleasing unto Him. I want it when we come together, because we're together with God, we get a little closer. Wisdom and instruction sounds pretty good, doesn't it? Applied truth, to know truth. Thus, a study of God's Word. Look in verse number 10. Isaiah 55, verse 10. As the rain comes down and the snow from heaven. My daughter stayed up the other night because she thought there was going to be snow. She said she thinks she saw it at 3 o'clock in the morning. I'm like, what are you doing awake at 3 o'clock in the morning? As the rain comes down. Did y'all get rain the other day? In buckets. As the snow from heaven. And they do not return but water the earth. And make it bring forth and bud, praise God, we need it. That it may give seed to the sower and bread to the either. So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please. It shall prosper in the thing for which I send it. The word of God. We're going to begin this year with a message on the word of God. It's like the Empire State Building. It's right there, but we walk right by it. How can we miss it? How many of you have copies of the Bible in your home? How many of you have them in different places in your home? In your bedroom, in the living room, and all there? And, and my goodness, don't they just look so good there? You can even take the, the TV remote and put it on top of your Bible as you're watching TV. The very wisdom of God, can I say it this way? That every one of us take for granted. When I lead a person to Christ, one of the very first things that I tell them, I say, go to the book of John. Just read a chapter a day. Read a chapter a day. How many of you made a New Year's resolution to uh, read the Bible this year? Evidently nobody, because none of y'all made resolutions. Does that mean you're not going to read the Bible this year? 
I met a person one time, they said, uh, I said, well, you know, the Bible says, they said, I've read the Bible. I'm like, well, bless your heart, I have too. <laughs> Evidently, they had it so good that they read it the first time and they just got a complete understanding of the whole thing. You know, I've read these things and I read it and I read it and, and, and somehow when I'm not looking, the Holy Spirit slips a word in there. And that word will catch me and it will give me that day exactly what I need that day. The wisdom, the truth for that day. It takes a personal reading of the Word of God. We walk by the Word all the time and we just take it for granted. Number two, it takes a disciplined reading of the Word of God. Satan fights hard with laziness and distraction to keep us. I think you need a planned approach, and there are many of them. There are many of them. You know the old saying, how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. Hopefully well cooked. The Word of God is well cooked. Some people will, well, I'm going to read the Bible this year. And they'll take off in Genesis, and bam, they're, they're reading. 20 chapters a day. And then they get to Exodus, and they say, it's pretty good. They get to Leviticus, and they never get to chapter 2. Didn't that happen? Happened so much? Look, one of the wisest people that I've ever met, I mentioned him last week in my sermon. His name was Clarence Davis. He, he, he was born in 1918. He was just brilliant. Uh, he was a quiet man. He was an unassuming man if you were around him. You would not, until you talked to him, you would never know how brilliant he was. Mr. Uh, L.G. Letourneau in Tacoa had this big steel. He made these, these buildings that were, he moved mountains. You should read the story about him. He's a great Christian man. Brother Clarence was one of his people. Uh, R.G. Letourneau would say, it needs to look like this, and he would draw one up for him. Caterpillar was given their plans to make their, their machinery from L.G. Letourno. He just gave it to them free. <laughs> Clarence was also a lay preacher. And he would preach in all these churches. He probably did over a thousand funerals. He was so desperately loved. But here's one of the things that I caught from him that I pray that you will too. He would read the Word of God and God would give him something and he would study on it all week. He would just stop and pause and think about it in contemplation. He would pray over it. Because he told me, he says, Brian, if I get one thought of God a week and I make it my own, I'm a rich man. How many of y'all have daily devotions? Ed, how many daily devotions do you have? 17. Bless your heart. You got me outpaced by a lot. I love that. And if you read 17 of them, one of those is going to get you. Amen? It might be the first one. It might be the 17th one, but it's going to get you. But what we need to do is absorb it and love it and think about it and pray over it. Maybe talk to other people about it. A systematic plan. Number, number three. It needs to be a, a systematic approach. The Word will never contradict itself, so read it in context. Don't have any of this standalone theology. I'm not going to mention the name of the religion, but there's a, a religion that goes by the same Bible that we go by. And they say that there is no hell because they take a misunderstanding of Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 5, to say that there's no understanding, it all goes away, and they say that there is no hell. So they totally disregard everything else in the Bible that talks about hell. Jesus talked more about hell than he did in heaven, right? They disregard all that because they take one verse out of context in Ecclesiastes. Be, be careful getting your theology out of Ecclesiastes. Uh, Solomon said, all, vanity of vanities, all is vanity, says the preacher. He was in a bad mood when he wrote that. Actually, he was in a bad place in his life and he was being honest about it. And he talked about all of his failures until he got to the very end of it. Read it in context. If you don't understand it, back up a chapter or two and get a running 
run and look at it. Follow along. See how it fits. What is it that God's trying to say something to us? And don't try to take two verses from two different places and blend them together where they don't fit. Matthew 27, 5 says, and Judas went out and hung himself. Luke 10 says, go you and do likewise. I don't believe we should do that. <laughs> Let's not put those two together. Let's read it in context. It'd be under preaching. I pray that you're under good preaching. And for those of you who are at New Holland, um, bless you. I do the best I can. I try to be faithful to the Word. But follow the Word of God. Let preaching not be one of those things that when it comes to an end, you close the Bible and you're done with it. You know the greatest compliment that I can receive is if you take the text that I have read from and I have preached and you go back and you study it yourself and you come back and you talk to me about it and you know and say, preacher, I like what you said, but did you see this? What a compliment. Preaching. Good books. By the way, not every book is a good book. This is the good book, right? But I'll even tell you about this. The Word of God is the inspired, infallible Word of God. Amen? It will not let you down. But the footnotes are not. You got a study Bible? It might be good, it might be bad. I've got some in my office. I don't read the footnotes because I know the person who wrote it and I know their point of view and their point of view and my understanding of the Scripture is two different things. We need the joint study of the Word of God. You know what would tickle me to death? is if the parking lot was as full at 9 o'clock when we have Sunday school as it is at 10 o'clock when we have church. If you don't want to be a part of Sunday school, get in a small group. I don't care if small groups meet on Sunday. I don't care. If I got two groups that meet on Monday. We're about to split them up. And, and I'm going to start another one. Two's going to become three. Even though I'm only going to teach two. There's something about getting around five, six people and studying the Word of God together. Friendships occur. A binding of your heart occurs. In Sunday school, I don't really teach. I teach Sunday school as well. But we'll put a verse up on the board and we'll discuss it. And most of the discussion, most of what we talk about is what the class says, not what I say. Is that right? Say amen, Steve. Yeah, yeah. I have to prompt that of him, but it's... <laughs> if you're not in a small group, you're missing it. To your own detriment. You need to be in a group. You need to be with other people. By the way, girls need girls. Guys... We need to be around other guys that will be honest with us. That will call you on your junk. That will encourage you. But let me tell you, in our society today, we are told they are ex that people are extremely lonely. <clears throat> January 1st was a Monday. So I get a call from Lance, we having small groups on Monday? And I said, no. Well, I just was wondering. He can't wait to get there. We called off small groups one night, and he came anyway because he said, I didn't know if somebody might just show up and I would at least have somebody to talk to and we could discuss the Word of God with. And I thought, how sweet. Now, that hunger he's got is why he's growing. Prayer. And obedience. Church, 
we're going to begin the year putting our focus back on the Word of God. It's not everything God knows, but it's everything you need to know. It will not let you down. The inspired, infallible, inerrant Word of God. It will not return void. You maybe will hear a sermon and it needs to percolate in your life for a few months, but there is going to come a point in time that Scripture is going to come back to you and the Holy Spirit is going to say, do you remember when? And you're going to have to walk it out. Be encouraged by it. I don't want to be ignorant. Cunningly aware. Having made up my own mind with my own thoughts. I don't want to be able to live like that. Fools find no use in wisdom and instruction. That's why so many people decide that they don't need to pick up the Bible and read it. They don't need to go to church. We don't need all those people. I had someone one time tell me, I just don't like being in crowds. You're not going to like heaven. I got a lot of kinfolk up there. By the way, Doug, M and J's is pretty good, but I believe heaven's going to be better. I'm going to get up to that marriage, marriage supper of the Lamb. I'm going to scoot up to the table, and I'm going to eat and eat and eat. Taste and see that the Lord is good. What's your desire? What's your passion? What is it you'd like to see God accomplished? Are you ready to grow? Are you ready to be challenged? Are you good? Or do you need a fresh touch? Are you thirsty for the water of life? Oh, what God can do. Oh, what He wants to do. He's the Almighty. His ways are beyond our ways. His thoughts are greater than our thoughts. But yet, He opens the door of heaven and says, come in, let's have a relationship together. Shouldn't we start the year with a new, fresh, what's the word? Hmm, what do we do at the beginning of the year? What is it we call it? A resolution? May we resolve to spend more time with God than we ever have.